Okay, so last time we learned about two crucial notions, two crucial notions. What is a differentiable function between two regular surfaces? And even more importantly, in some sense, what is the tangent space to a surface at a given point? Okay, so now, for the first thing we are going to do today is a simple extension of a notion that we know from calculus, basically the differential of a map. Once we know what is a differentiable map, it's very natural to ask whether we can define the differential of a map okay, at a given point. But that's easy if you remember, if you go back to lecture one, well, no, lecture one on surfaces, I mean, where I gave you my slightly more general definition of differential of a map, now things are very easy because if we have, so this is a definition of the differential, but it looks a bit strange because actually the, the symbols will be the same that we've used in the classical case. So now, suppose you have a function from S to Rn, a differentiable map. So now you know what it means. We fix a point, P, on the surface, and we fix a vector, a tangent vector, at, the, at this given point. So, since V is a tangent vector, by definition, we know that there exists alpha from minus epsilon, epsilon to S, differentiable such that alpha of zero is equal to P, and alpha prime of zero is equal to V. This comes automatic with the definition. Okay, it's the tangent vector to a curve on the surface. Okay, so now how do we define the differential of the map F at the point P in the direction V? Well, we take the same formula we used before. This is D in DT, that is the derivative at T equal to zero of the composition F composed alpha. F composed alpha becomes a curve, a differentiable curve with values in Rn. So we know perfectly well what it means to take the derivative at time zero, okay? And that's it. So in another notation that we will use sometimes, I just indicate it like this, okay? Derivative at time zero, okay? Now what is the problem? As before, as for the general, slightly more general definition I gave you from, for maps between Euclidean spaces, in principle, this definition depends on alpha and not just on P and V. So the first, proposi the, only, I mean, the first proposition we have to prove is that actually DFP of V is well defined. Okay, <clears throat> meaning it does not depend on alpha. Okay? And actually improving it as before, we are going to get a formula which is useful for computation. Okay, so proof. <clears throat> How do we do it? Well, remember that we are always behind our shoulders. There is always the same picture. Okay, we have the surface. We have a point, we have the vector, and we have a little curve here, alpha of t, which has passing through this point with this tangent vector, okay? But it's a regular surface. So you should add on, on top of this picture the other picture, which reminds you that this is a regular surface. So around this point, there is a local chart. So there is an open set, a map, and some open set in R2, giving you a local parameterization of this surface, okay? So in terms of this x, <clears throat> so let x from u to s be a local chart around p, remember we proved last time that the tangent space TPS is the image of the differential of the map X at the point X inverse of P of the whole of R2, which is the domain of the map, of the differential of the map X, okay? 
So in fact, just to shorten a little bit the notation, let me call the point Q x inverse of p. That means this point, I mean, there's a point, a special point here, which is the one which hits p via the map x. Okay. And of course, by simple topology, we can take the part of alpha whose image lies in the image of x by restricting epsilon, if necessary, we don't care. So we can assume that alpha of minus epsilon, epsilon is actually contained in x of u. This is not a real restriction, okay? Take epsilon sufficiently small, okay? But then we do exactly what we did last time for other reasons. If we have this little piece of curve on S, we can pull it back on U. Okay, we can compose with X inverse. And we get some, some curve here. Okay, so let me call it, so the curve X inverse composed alpha. Now it's defined always on minus epsilon, epsilon. And it has values in U, so values in R2 in particular. Okay. And of course, everything is built in a way that if you compute this curve at time zero, you get the point Q, because you get X inverse of P. Okay. But OK, let's do the simplest thing. Of course, alpha is equal to x composed x inverse of alpha. Okay. I compose one map with this inverse. I get the identity. I've done nothing. Okay. But out of this stupid relationship, we can take derivatives. Okay. If I differentiate this, this uh, equality of maps, what do I get? So taking derivative. or I mean taking differential, okay, the derivative at time at t equal to zero. I mean, but here there is only one variable, which is t. So it's really one derivative. We get, let me write it here. So dx q at the vector, applied to the vector, composed, okay? dxq applied to this vector, this is equal to v. You see, actually I switched the equality. Okay? Alpha prime at time 0 is equal to v. But if I take the derivative of this composition at time 0, by definition, I get this, okay? by chain rule. But the x is an isomorphism between the domain and the image. Remember, the x goes from R2 to R3, so it cannot be an isomorphism just by itself. But on the image, it is an isomorphism. It's one of the requirements of the definition of a regular surface. So since I know that, of course, this is in the image, I can apply to it the inverse of the x. So out of this relationship, I get, so this implies Oh, in fact, it's the same thing to say that x to the minus 1 composed f, uh, the, the differentiated with respect to t at time 0, is equal to dx q inverse of v. OK? OK, let's freeze this. We learned this. Let's freeze it for a moment, because actually what we really have in mind is this derivative here. What is the derivative of f composed alpha? So now let's go to the, how much is this? Well, what do I do? In between f and alpha, I can put an x, I can compose in between with x and x inverse. x composed x inverse is always the identity. So if I add it or erase it, Nothing changes, OK? So this is d in dt at t equal to 0 of what? I write it in this way, of f composed x 
composed x inverse composed alpha. OK? But then, do you agree? Oh, so uh, d in dt at t equal to 0. OK, I put it here. So but then well, how much is this? Again, I use the chain rule. I now apply to this, compose with this. Forget it that each of them is a composition. OK? I look at it as a composition of these two things, 1 and 2. OK? But if I do that, what do I get? I get that this is equal to the differential of the map f composed x of the first one at the point q applied to the, to the derivative vector of the second one at the corresponding point, which is x inverse composed alpha at time 0. OK. Is it clear here there is a derivative sign? OK. And now you see why we lost three minutes before. These were not lost minutes because we have a nice expression for this vector. OK, this is the part which contains f, and I keep it. But this one, I can manipulate it. So this becomes the differential of f composed x at the point q. And then instead of this, I rewrite this formula applied. OK, let's be a bit more dx q inverse of v. <clears throat> so now, now this seems a uh, strangely complicated formula, but here, what, what do we have here on this side? On the left, we have exactly the definition of the differential. Okay? So what's, what is really written here is that, so written in another form, this is the differential of the map F at the point P evaluated on the vector v is equal to that expression there. Let me rewrite it. I don't change it. f composed x q dx q inverse v. <coughs> so in fact, I can write it in terms of maps. So this is for any vector v, I get this equality. That means as linear maps, this map is equal to this map here. OK? And that's it. Now, it doesn't matter how horrible this looks like. This expression here does not contain alpha anymore. But it contains x here. That's OK. What? OK, so the objection of your colleague is, a, is, a, is, an impo is an interesting objection. He's saying, well, now I removed alpha from the formula, but I'm paying the price of introducing x. OK, no problem, because look at the def So depending on what you want to prove, but here we are, we are trying to prove that this is well defined. The only problem coming from the definition is alpha. It's not x. So if I give you a formula for the differential which does not contain alpha, I'm done. Of course, this expression depends on x. But you see, if I take y, I take another chart, y, okay, from another open set uh, v to a neighbor of p on s. Of course. This expression will change. I mean, this will change and this will change. Of course, the two together, no, because of this. OK? But each of these pieces will change. But this is irrelevant for our problem. So for any chart, I have an expression. That's OK. The important thing is that this expression does not depend on alpha, but only of the value on alpha of alpha and its derivative at time 0. OK? It's a good question, I'm saying. But the logic of the, of the problem 
makes it irre irrelevant if this at the end depends on x or not. Okay. Okay. So this expression does not depend on alpha. And this ends the proof. OK. Of course, even without erasing everything, here I gave you the definition of the differential of a map when the map has a domain, a regular surface, and a target, a Euclidean space. Remember, last time we learned not just what it, what, that, what it means for a function of this type to be differentiable, but also what it means for a function among, between two surfaces, S and S1. So you might say, well, but is there another definition of differential? So suppose you take now a function, if your old function was defined on S, but, in some, but you knew the target was S1. Well, but you see, the point is that this definition covers also this case. Because another regular surface is, in particular, the subset of R3. So the differential of a map from, of a map from S to S1 now is well defined. It's a special case of this. OK? Moreover, and here I need at least a few lines of blackboard. <coughs> OK, I keep it for a second, the definition. So if f was a function from s to another regular surface, let me say f1, I can use the same definition, and I have a well-defined map dfp for any p in s and for any v in tps. I know what it means this symbol here, OK? Using the same thing. You forget that the values are on S1. It's just something in R3, OK? But now, if you look a bit closely, what it's where, actually, is this any vector of R3? Because, of course, the differ you see here, the differential of the map now goes from the tangent space to the surface into Rn in general, OK? This is, in principle, this is any vector of Rn. Now, in this specific particular case, is this vector special? Yes. Because it's what? It is the velocity at time 0 of a curve of this form. In particular, a curve of this form is a curve on S1. Alpha goes from an interval to S. F goes from S to S1. The composition is a curve on S1. So then this vector, where does it belong to? The tangent space of at which point? At the point F of P of S1. OK? So in general, the differential of the map goes from the tangent space to the domain to the tangent space at the corresponding point of the codomain. Okay, in this particular case, if the codomain is a surface, we have given it a name and a symbol and so on. Okay? Now, I won't prove because actually. Now that you have seen the definition and you have recognized that the definition is exactly the one, the classical one, there is only the restriction that the curve lies on S. That's the only, so it's a special case in some sense of the classical definition of maps between Euclidean spaces. All the algebraic properties that held in, for Euclidean spaces holds also now. What do I mean? chain rule, for example. So if I have a picture like this, I have S1 and S2, I have a map here, F. 
And now suppose you have another map from S2 to S3. You have another map G. Okay? And both are differentiable, of course. Otherwise, you cannot even talk about the differential. Then, first observation, the composition is differentiable. That's something you can check immediately. And you have the same formula for the differential. The differential of the composition at a given point P here, you pick a point here, OK? Now, the, you look at it as a map from S1 to S3. So this object here takes a tangent vector to S1 at the point P to the tangent vector to S3 at the point G composed F of P, OK? But this is exactly like for chain rule. This is dg at the point fp composed dfp. OK? And the proof is exactly like the one you know for maps. If this was rn, rk, rp, you write down the proof, and that's it. OK? Now, <clears throat> okay. so we will refer to this as kind of the chain rule for maps between surfaces. OK, as a kind of an exercise about this definition, let me give you two examples of computations about the differential, just to give a little bit of spice to it. I will draw also some conclusions. So example one, suppose you take a symmetric, so A, a symmetric 3 by 3 matrix. OK. So what does it mean, symmetric? Symmetric it means I'm looking at as a transformation of R3 are three with the standard scalar Euclidean scalar product. So symmetric means the scalar product between A, V, W is equal to V, A, W for any V, W in R3. Okay. This means symmetric. <clears throat> now, one of the basic properties that you know about symmetric matrices, probably you should know, that they are diagonalizable with an orthonormal basis, OK? Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can prove it, at least in dimension 3, using the notion of the differential of a map. It's nice. It's kind of fun, OK? So let, let me define, I mean, if I want to use the differential of a map, I, I need to better define a function. So what kind of function I look at? I take f from the two sphere. Let me just indicate, I mean, if you want, we center the origin and radius 1 okay, from, from the standard, I mean, the, this sphere to, to the real numbers, taking a point P and computing AP. So in particular, P is a point on the sphere. It's a point of, it's a vector of R3. So A acts on P. Okay. And I take AP scalar product P. Okay. OK, this seems like a strange definition. Now, in, in fact, this gives me an excuse to give you a general definition. So what is a critical point of a function defined on a surface, whatever, wherever? OK, so critical point, a critical point for a function, I repeat, is not related just to this function, OK, in general. If you have a function, what does it mean, a critical point? It's a point on the domain, so in particular, in this case, on the two sphere, such that the differential of the map at this point is 0. 0 meaning the 0 homomorphism, OK? It's the 0 map, OK? Now, problem, in this specific case, are we able to characterize critical points? 
So which are the critical points of this function? Well, we have to compute the differential of this map. Okay. So we take V in TP as 2. And we compute DFP V. <clears throat> How do we do it? Well, we have only the definition. So take the definition. We imagine, we don't even write it down, to a, since this is a tangent vector, there is a curve on the two sphere, such alpha, such that alpha of zero is p, and alpha prime of zero is v. Okay? And this is d in dt, by definition, of f composed alpha. Okay, now let's write down what is f composed alpha. We have the explicit expression for f. So this means this is a, so this is d in dt at t equal to zero of the function a applied to the vector alpha of t scalar product alpha of t. Okay? How much is it? Scalar product gets, gets differentiated like the usual product, so derivative of the first times the second plus first times derivative of the second. So let's do it. A is a constant matrix, so A doesn't matter. So this becomes uh, A alpha prime at 0 times alpha of 0 plus A alpha of 0 alpha prime at 0. OK? But now this, these objects have a name. This is what? This is A V scalar product P plus A P scalar product V. Okay. Now, A was a symmetric matrix. So I'm free to choose which one I like most. I can take A on the, on the place I prefer and nothing changes. I prefer this one, okay? So I put this A here, and this becomes exactly the same thing, okay? Because the scalar product is symmetric, again. So this, I write it as 2 AP, sorry, AP scalar product V. Now, okay, so this was the computation of, of, the, of the differential of the map. Now, how can P be a point with a critical point? So now, suppose that this map is identically zero. So that means, what does it mean it's identically zero? Well, it's identically zero means that whatever V in the tangent space at P not, not for any V in R3. So now here becomes the only delicate point. For any V in the tangent space to the sphere at this point, this object is zero. But that means AP is orthogonal to the tangent space, say it geometrically. But what is the tangent space to the sphere? We have checked it last time just to be sure that we were on the right track. The tangent space to the sphere at a given point P is the orthogonal to P. So put these two informations together, and how, how is it possible that P satisfies this equation for any V? So the moral is that P is critical if and only if, you know, if you put V is free to move in the whole tangent space. So which is the only vector which is orthogonal to the tangent space at the point P? Well, zero is orthogonal to everything, but I mean. P. P. Now, of course, I said it 
in a slightly non-precise way because, of course, there is not only one vector. There is only one direction, okay? So P is critical if and only if this vector here is that one up to a multiple, okay? So it lies on the line Okay, I cannot be sure which multiple. Okay. On the other hand, this multiple is not free to be anything in this case. Okay. Because if if it is true that AP is equal to lambda P, take the scalar product with P. And I get what? I get AP scalar P is equal lambda 1, because I am on the sphere of radius 1. So lambda is not free to be anything. It has to be exactly this number. And this number is what? In our language, f of p. OK? So if and only if a p is equal f of p times p. OK? Well, up to now, algebra and, and this computation. I mean, you, you have to take it as an exercise in, about computing differentials, OK? Now, so what do I want to prove? So all this was behind everything. Now, the claim is there is an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors for A. OK, why? Well, first case, if f is constant, if, if f for some accident is the constant function, well, if f is constant, a has to be a multiple of the identity. And in that case, it's already diagonalizable, I mean, it's already diagonalized. I mean, the standard basis is a basis of eigenvectors, OK? So in this case, A is equal, if you want, mean identity. And in this case, the, the existence of the orthonormal basis is stupid, OK? Second possibility, F is not constant, which will be kind of the general case. So how do I argue? Well, if it's not constant, I just observe that the two sphere is I would like to, to say, oh, observe here. Maybe what is the philosophy of this exercise? If I know that the function has a critical point, I'm happy. You see, here there is written exactly that the point P is an eigenvector. It's a multiple of P. A of P is a multiple of P. Hence, P is an eigenvector. So my question is, do I know that the function F has critical points? In some sense, what I'm saying is that what I'm to prove that every matrix, uh, symmetric matrix, has an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, I need to show that there are at least three critical points. OK? So if f is constant, you can check. I mean, if f is constant, essentially everything is a critical, every point is a critical point, and I can do whatever I want. Now suppose f is non-constant. Who is going to tell me that there exists at least one? Let's start with one. In fact, once you get one, you get automatically two. It's impossible to get one. Yes, you consider the equation a t equals to lambda p, and you find a covariance of the matrix. That's if you study algebra. Okay, solving the the eigenvalue and eigenvector equation is what you have been taught in algebra. S two is compact. S two is compact. The sphere is compact, so every function has 
as a maximum and a minimum. That's why, I mean, you get automatically two, okay? And you need to observe that a, that a maximum and a minimum is a critical point, okay, in this sense. But actually, the proof is exactly the one you know. Okay, there is nothing new to be proved. So let's give them a name. So S2, S2, 0, 1 is compact. F is, of course, continuous. In part I mean, it's differentiable. So uh, let me call them. So there exists P1 and P2 on the sphere, maximum and minimum for F. Okay, so in particular, critical points. <clears throat> so, if I look them as vectors of R3, P1 and P2, P1 and P2, are automatically eigenvectors of norm 1, because they are on the sphere. Okay, so they are automatically normalized to be of norm 1. Okay, so what do I need to prove? I need to check whether they are orthogonal or not, because remember the theorem is saying there is an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. But then, so claim P1, let me write it in symbols, P1 orthogonal to P2. How do I check it? Well, of course I should compute P1 scalar product P2. Okay, but let me compute this instead, this little variation of this. So I multiply what, I really, what, what I'm really interested in, P1 scalar product P2, with this number. You will see now, it's just a computational trick. This number is non-zero because F is non-constant and this is the maximum and this is the minimum. So the maximum and the minimum cannot be the same value. So this, this number is non-zero, okay? This is important because now I will argue that this is, on the contrary, that this object altogether is zero. So I need to conclude that this is zero, okay? Well, how do I manipulate this? Well, I put, so this is equal to FP1, P1, scalar product P2, minus P1, FP2, P2. I've done nothing, okay? Take the first one, I put it here, the second one, I put it there. But then I go up here. If I have a critical point, I have this equation. Okay, so F1 P1, F1 P1 times P1 is actually A P1. And this one is A P2. Okay, I know that P1 and P2 are critical points. So this, is, this expression is equal to the scalar product A P1 P2 minus P1 A P2. And that's it. A is symmetric. So choose the one you like most. For example, put A here, and you are done. This difference is zero because they are the same. As I said before, this is not zero, and so this is zero, which is my claim. Well, it's part of my claim, because now what do I know? I know that this matrix A has two orthogonal eigenvectors of norm one. I miss one. There should be a third one. 
And that's what, but actually you see, up to now, R3 was irrelevant. You could have taken a symmetric n by n object. And these two would be there. Now, that's the only moment where the, the, the final part of the proof works only because you are in R3. Because if you have two eigenvectors, orthogonal, where, where is the only possible third one? So you just take the wedge of those two and you check that it works. And it's the only possibility. There is nothing else. Okay? So. <clears throat> Sorry? Hilbert Schmidt. Hilbert Schmidt. Uh, well, I don't know how you, I mean. Generalization of compact operators. Well, compact and symmetric are not automatically the same thing, no? OK. If you want to give them a name, I mean. It's the beginning of spectral theory, if you want, I mean. But, but this is really the very beginning of spectral theory, OK? Now. Another example, you see, okay, it was fun. We introduced a few concepts which are nice to know, critical points and so on. But really, the excuse was to compute the differential of a map and to make some consideration about it, okay? Let's make another example of this type with a more geometric function. So now, instead of taking a problem and build up a function, we have a function which has already a natural geometric meaning, and we want to compute the differential of this map. So in this case, we take <clears throat> the distance square. Remember, we have a little list of interesting functions. So example two, we have a surface in R3, a regular surface. We have a point, independently whether this is on the surface or not. We don't care at the beginning. Our function, f of p, is the distance square from the point. So f, I think of f as a function from s to r, in particular to the, I mean, non-negative r, but doesn't matter. Now, <clears throat> I would like to understand whether this is, I mean, what are the critical points of this map? Well, if I want to know what are the critical points, I need to compute the differential and to analyze the expression that I get. So what is the differential of the map F? Again, goes without saying, if V, V means I have a tangent vector at a given point, okay? So goes without saying, but I say it because we are at the beginning of the story, I take a curve alpha, on S, such that alpha of zero is equal to P and alpha prime of zero is equal to V, okay? And this is by definition D in DT at T equal to zero of F composed alpha. Now, I take the expression for F, but the norm square, of course, is the scalar product between the point and itself, the vector and itself. So this becomes alpha of T minus P naught, scalar product alpha of T minus P naught. Sorry, this is equal to the derivative at time zero. OK? As usual, the, the, uh, the scalar product gets differentiated in the usual way, and I get what? I get twice. I know already that it's becoming the same thing. V scalar product P minus P naught. OK? OK? So let's try to draw, draw, let's draw a picture. What's going on? We have a surface. I mean, let's suppose the point is here, the point where I'm measuring distances from, just to draw a picture. I take a point P somewhere on the surface, and I'm asking, is this point a, a, a critical point? Well, critical point, as before, means DFP is equal to 0 as a linear map. But we have this expression. So I can phrase it geometrically quite easily. What does it mean that the point P is a critical point? It means that for any tangent vector, 
if I draw, if I take the vector p minus p naught, p minus p naught is orthogonal to the tangent space at p. So for example, the, p, the, the point I've picked here is not, or it doesn't look like. Okay? Where would be a critical point? Well, more or less somewhere here, there is a chance of having a critical point. Because if I draw there the tangent space more, I mean, if my picture is not, okay, the normal line to the surface at this point, meaning the normal direction to the tangent space, hits the point P0. Okay? So in fact, let me phrase it geometrically in this way. So P is critical, P is critical for F if and only if the normal line and the explanation of what is the normal line is just the picture, okay? Is the line passing through the point P with direction, the orthogonal direction to the tangent space. That's the normal line. If and only if the normal line at P, so if you want to be a bit too precise, the normal line 2s, okay, to the surface at P passes through P0. <clears throat> But now again, simple, okay, the exercise is, is over, no? I mean, we have already computed the differential. But let's do, let's play the same game we did before. If S is compact, so again, how do I know that there are critical points? I don't know, in general. But if S is compact, I have a minimum and a maximum. Again, there are at least two critical points. <clears throat> and now, depending of what are you thinking which is fixed and what are you thinking moving, because in some sense there was a parameter in this discussion which was the place where you put the point P0. So, for example, if you reverse your, our imagination now, if S, you can say the following, if S is compact, and if I look at the normal lines at, the, at every point, Okay, you see, to draw the normal line, I don't need P0. No? I have a surface, and at every point, I think of the normal line. Then I pick another point, I have a normal line. So, for example, you could, you could ask, how big is the set of spanned by the normal lines? I mean, is every point hit by one of these lines? Is every point of R3 hit by one of these lines? It's a natural question. The answer, if S is compact, is yes. In general, I don't know. But if S is compact, Pick the point that you want to hit. Okay, you want to hit this point here? Okay, take this point. Construct the distance with this function and take one of these two critical points. You have reversed the process. So you want to hit this, take it. Construct the function, take the critical point, one of the two critical points that exist, and by by what we just observed here, the normal line that the critical point must hit is point P0. Okay? So every point of R3 lies on one normal line, at least one, maybe more. Okay? Which is kind of nice. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I'm sorry, but the piece of paper, is it uh, the whole plane or a, or a piece? Yes, only piece. Yes. A piece? A piece of the plane? Yes. How can it be compact? It's compact because it's bound. It's not a surface. Oh, maybe good, good exercise. A disk with its boundary, for example, if you want a rectangle with its boundary, is not a regular surface. So it should be regular. In fact, for example, I mean, because, f and, it's, and it's crucial. Because you see, after all, what, what are you measuring here with this function? The distance squared. So if you take a disk and you pick a point here, of course, the point of minimal distance will be on the boundary. And the point of maximal distance will be on the boundary. And you cannot take them because they are exactly where the definition of regular surface fails. So they will not be critical points. So they are critical points only because you have taken a small piece of something, but if you complete it, they are not. Okay. Well, there is another extreme of this picture, just since we are here in two minutes, we, you can say, well, we have just observed, if S is compact, then every point of R3 is hit by a normal line. Other extreme, somehow, inspired by the sphere. So what happens in the case of the sphere? Well, in the case of the sphere, if you look at the, normal, the set of normal lines, well, of course, basically, you are taking polar coordinates. Okay? I mean, you take lines because the usual identification, not the normal v vector to the tangent space is the point itself. So the normal line is exactly the, the radius, the position vector. Okay? That's okay. And so it's clear that every point is hit. Okay? Now, but here there is another accident. It's not only true that every point is hit, but there is one point through which every, every normal line passes through this. Okay? This, is an, this seems an accident. Is it an accident or not? So suppose, so now forget that this is the sphere. Call it S. Suppose if there exists a point P0 in R3 such that each normal line normal line pass or to S. So you have your surface and each normal line to S passes through the same point, P0. Then, then it is a sphere. Of course, I don't know which sphere. I don't know the center. Well, in fact, the center is P0. I don't know the radius. Okay? So S is equal. So S2 in our language, P0, R for some R. And how do you prove it? If there is a point with this property, take this point, build the function distance squared, and what, what is, what's going on? Every point on the surface is a critical point because of this. Every point is a critical point. But then, what is a function? Which, which functions, for which functions every point is a critical point? It must be a constant, okay? But what does it mean it's a constant? It means S is exactly the locus Norm P minus P naught squared is equal to something, C, to a constant C. But that's exactly the, the, the equation of the sphere. In fact, here I've been a, a bit sloppy because maybe it's not the whole sphere, no? Maybe it's an open subset of the sphere. Okay, let me leave it like that, okay?
meaning open subset. Okay. <clears throat> so you can phrase it as a little theorem, no? If all the normals to a connected surface pass through the same point, then the surface is a, it's a, it's an open set of the sphere. Okay? It's a simple characterization. <clears throat> well, I guess this is a good moment to stop. Today we have a shorter, shorter lecture. Okay? And we stop here. <clears throat>